I know we're still, still lots of people coming in. It's, it's fantastic to see so many people here this morning for, for a subject that's obviously caused a great deal of interest, not only in Hoylake, but across the, the rest of the world and further afield than that. Uh, my name's Colin Lehman, and for some bizarre reason, I have agreed to be the independent chair of this morning's meeting. I was delighted to be asked by Margaret's office if I would do it. At the time now, I'm not quite so sure. The weather's not great, and uh, I should probably be out Christmas shopping. The present Mrs. Lehman's sitting at the back, and she's probably wondering what she's going to get for Christmas. Well, with me being here, it's not an awful lot, to be quite honest. Um, just to give you a, a bit of a, a talk to her about the plans for this morning before Margaret herself said, Tell us who you are, please. I just said my name's Colin Lehman. I, I am just I am just a member of the society. I worked for 30 years for Merseyside Police. I was uh, a senior officer within Merseyside Police. Uh, I retired. The very first place I ever worked was at Hoylake. So Hoylake is very, very special to me. Uh, I now work for Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary. Uh, so I now travel the, the country looking at police forces make sure they are delivering the service for the public that they should be. So that's, that's my role, but I'm here purely as an independent, an independent chair. Um, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm delighted to have been asked by Margaret to come here this morning and to chair this meeting. It is fantastic to see so many of you here, and this is an opportunity for, for everyone here to hear the views of people about this subject, and particularly important for Margaret. Yeah, I'm, we're doing our very, very best, sir, to get everybody in. There is still some space up in this still. top corner. People want to move up into this corner. Hello, how are you? Can I stand behind you? Is that right if I just... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very conscious that we've got until 11 o'clock this morning. The hall, as you know, is really popular. It has to be got ready for another event. Uh, so we have until 11 o'clock and the important thing... Just move forward, please. If you can, please, ladies and gentlemen. I said it is important that we try and keep things moving along so that your views are heard here this morning. You're going to, you're going to hear two presentations. You're going to hear from Mark Howard from the Hoylake Village Life and from Kevin O'Rourke from the Stop Hoylake Golf Resort Action Group. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You're also going to hear from uh, Phil Davis, the leader of Wirral Council. And, uh, and David Ball, who's the council officer with responsibility for this project. Um, the rules are very, very simple this morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to listen to the presentations, and then I'm going to open the floor to questions. And no doubt many of you have got questions that you want to ask. All I would ask is, please, that if you respect the speakers and respect the audience by not shouting out uh, during the question time or heckling the speakers, that would be really, really good. Right, I think it's important we make a move to get it started. But before we do, I'm just going to hand the microphone over to Margaret who wants to say a few words. Thank you very much, Colin. And um, I want to, first of all, thank absolutely everybody for coming out here this morning. Um, I've called this meeting. I'm the local member of parliament, Margaret Greenwood. So 
So I'm here to represent your views. I don't have a say in planning matters. I'm not, you know, I don't work at the town hall. So, but it is important for me to understand what local people feel about the proposed golf resort. Now, a huge number of people have written to me, hundreds of people have written to me with questions. And we're collating those questions. So we will be forwarding those to the council for, for their response to them. But this morning, really, I'm very, uh, what I'm here for is to hear people's views and to hear the presentations. So as and I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone doing presentations and a particular thank you to Colin, who I first met at the Hustings during the general election. So that, that's the connection with Colin. That's why we did such a good job on the Hustings. That's, that's, that's how we got to know Colin. Uh, so thanks you for all being here. If you don't get the chance to ask your question and with the shortage of time, it's possible that you won't, please do email me or write to me, okay? Uh, we have to be out of here at 11 o'clock, but I will be around outside if people want to talk to me as well. Thanks. Right, thanks, Margaret. Now we're going to hand over then to, to Mark Howard from the Hoylake Village Life. Thank you. Yes, I will use this. Uh, my name's Mark Howard, and I'm a member of Hoylake Village Life, HVL for short, uh, which is a non-profit, volunteer-led community interest company. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Julian Priest, uh, HVL have been involved in setting up a, a number of different community projects over the years, uh, including Hoyle Community Cinema, which screens films here once a month and is a great community event. Please do come if you've not been already. Uh, the Beacon Steering Group, uh, which has developed plans for a new two-screen cinema uh, and art centre in the Old Town Hall and the land behind it with artists and makers, retail and studio units. The Hoyle Christmas Lights Group, which Julian and a great team of volunteers have done an amazing job uh, with this year and the Hoylake Vision Community Planning Forum, uh, which produced a neighbourhood development plan um, in consultation with the local community, an NDP, which was passed at local referendum just over a year ago. Now, the NDP is now part of the council's local plan, and we can answer questions about how that might impact on the council's <coughs> proposals later on. And we've also produced this alternative eco-golf resort, wild, wildlife, wildfowl and wild wetland centre project, which we're about to explain in more detail today. If you haven't picked up a copy of this, please do. There's, there's a, a load of them at the back. Uh, we brought 150, that may not be enough. It looks like it's not enough, uh, but we do have more. Um, now, I just want to mention who we've consulted with over the course of this project over the last six years. Gareth Bradbury is the Senior Consultant of Wildfire and Wetland Trust Consulting Limited. Nigel Symes is the Business Advice Unit Leader of RSPB. Sam Thomas is the Programme Director of the Gulf Environment Organisation. David McClay Kidd is the architect of the Macrihanish Dunes uh, Golf Resort, which is an eco-golf resort. <coughs> Dr Keith Duff, who is now retired but was for 35 years the Executive Director and Chief Scientist of English Nature or Natural England. And Peter Wilson, who is a Chartered Forester and Chartered Environmentalist. All of these people believe our proposals to be credible and achievable. We've done our homework. So the origins of the project. When HVL formed in 2009 to explore ways of tackling the issue of empty shops, Hoylake had a 25% vacancy rate. Uh, the council's idea of a five-star golf resort was at a very embryonic stage. Uh, but alarm bells were already ringing for us because of a question around funding. We suspected that some kind of development, whether residential, leisure, or retail, or commercial, would need to be in the minds of the council. So in 2011, we produced this document. Some of you may have seen an earlier iteration of this. We've now updated and printed a couple of hundred copies. Please do take one. Now, over the years, we've uh, shown it to lots of people, including our ward councillors. And I'm sorry to say, until very recently, it was met with, at best, ambivalence, perhaps fueled by a significant degree of incredulity that the council's five-star project uh, would go ahead. Well, six years on, here we are. Here we find ourselves, and in our view, this document is more relevant than ever, but still with very little political support or formal council recognition. Now, we hope this presentation will change that. So, in essence, this booklet suggests that the council need to consider integrating uh, a commercially operated wildfire and wetland centre on the site, capitalising on the growing trends for ecotourism, and making the most of our existing natural assets and Natura 2000 protections, the SSSI, the Ramsar, SAC and PSBA status, for example. Now we think this type of diversification will create a significantly more, uh, less risky and longer term and much more sustainable underlying business model for the project than relying on the upfront revenue from residential development. 
Let's think about future generations. Note the gratuitous use of cute ducklings. Wildfowl and wetland centres are economically and environmentally sustainable. They bring in huge footfall, creating rewarding local employment and providing many wonderful education and leisure opportunities. Now we've spoken to various organisations, as I said, including Wirral Wildlife, the Wildfowl and Wetland Trust, the RSPB and the Gulf Environment Organisation. And we found universal consensus that if designed and managed well, golf courses do benefit the environment and are havens for wildlife. But there's a big difference between water features that may attract some wildlife and make the game a bit more exciting for players and improving an entire wetland and coastal ecosystem. <coughs> now one of our advisors uh, has been David McClay Kidd, this guy. Uh, he's the architect of the Macro Hannes Dunes Resort in Kintyre, cited as one of the world's most eco-friendly coastal uh, resorts in the world. So check out YouTube for the Macro Hannes Dunes Golf Club to see how he approached that project. Now at the time, at the same time, we've also expressed concerns about the Council's beach management plan and did some research into it. And we uncovered some real concerns uh, and a lot of misinformation going around. So you may be thinking, oh, why is he talking about the beach? Well, because many of the same birds live and feed on the shore as well as in land. The area of the proposed golf resort includes roosting sites for the black-tailed godwit, for example. It is all part of a complex ecosystem and in need of tender loving care, not two completely separate environments. You see, it makes no sense to us to even consider a wildfowl and wetland centre over there, while on Hoylick Beach here, where the birds also use, the only long-term plan in evidence seems to be to spray glyphosate ad infinitum in the complete absence of any qualitative or quantitative data about the natural coastal processes that are taking place. Now, in case you didn't already know, we should point out that the EU's classification of glyphosate states dangerous for the environment, toxic to aquatic organization, or, or organizations, organisms, uh, may cause long-term adverse effects in the aquatic environment, uh, and chronic long-term aquatic hazard. Manufacturers Monsanto, perhaps unsurprisingly, say the exact opposite. <laughs> now, a meeting about beach management at St. Luke's Church in 2013 clearly demonstrated a polarised view on the issues. It seems that many people are content with doing whatever it takes, including spraying chemicals, to remove the grass, while a similar number seems to be very much against it. Now, the conclusion of Natural England is that scraping, digging and rotoburying techniques serve only to spread the grass rather than to remove it. So they've approved further spraying using glyphosate, okay? But in our view, and one that seems to be shared by a growing number of people, the current approach to beach management is ultimately doomed to failure, a futile effort to pause or reverse inevitable natural coastal processes. But the use of glyphosate is not the only option. We need to be thinking differently, and this proposed resort may help us do that. Now what was particularly interesting from that meeting was an offer of both Liverpool universities to explore the idea of conducting reversible field trials as recommended in this report uh, by almost 20 years ago by Alan Jemmett of the Merseyside Environmental Advisory Service. A report which came to the same conclusion back then. So perhaps those studies could be funded by the Dong Energy Coastal Communities Fund over the long term. Because there's another issue which is not going to go away in a hurry, increasing flood risk as sea levels rise and global warming impacts on so many aspects of our lives. It's widely accepted that dunes, slacks and wetland systems are a highly efficient <coughs> for flood defence, much cheaper and more efficient than hard defences. So again, because the proposed resort in the, is in a flood risk, we can't talk about landscaping for a golf resort or even a wetland centre without thinking through the issues of flood defences rather than increasing the flood risk to residents, businesses and infrastructure. So that also means thinking about the beach. Now if you look online, you'll find a very informative video about the Environment Agency's fantastic work at the, at, uh, with, with the World Parliament and Trust on this very issue at Steart Marshes. You see, whether we like it or not, the land behind being considered for the proposed golf resort and the beach are inextricably linked. Anything to do with the environment and with nature must be viewed holistically. At the moment, there's a worrying disconnect in this regard in the Council's approach to the golf resort and the beach. And I think we need to join the dots while gaining a better understanding of the issues. 
Wildfire and Wetland Trust would surely be the right partners for this. Now, we don't actually have a problem, HVL don't actually have a problem, with there being a golf resort in principle. Whilst it's true that golf club membership has been in decline, golf tourism is showing signs of growth. As a community interest company that supports economic development, we see this as an opportunity, but not at any cost. We're thinking holistically. The Beacon Scheme that I talked about earlier would be a great way to ensure visitors from uh, leave a hotel and venture into Hoy Lake. We just can't bring ourselves to support the golf resort project if it's to be funded by the building of 150 luxury houses, whether on Greenbelt or not, perhaps. We can't support it if it's to be one where the only water features are there to look pretty and to make the game a little more tricky. We can't support it when there appears to have been no real consideration or consultation on how the wildlife there and on the beach will be impacted by its design and long-term maintenance. And we certainly don't support a course which will have a heavy reliance on chemicals. As we found, it's quite possible to build a golf course that uses the absolute bare minimum and even in part bans chemicals, unlike on our beach at the moment. We suggest that a high-level conversation should be taking place between the Council, the Wildfire and Wetland Trust, the RSPB, the Golf Environment Organisation, the Environment Agency, Liverpool Universities, Dong Energy, Community Benefit Fund and others. We've spoken to them. The project could deliver a world-class eco-golf resort integrated with a wildfire and wetland centre that provides much greater opportunities for employment, leisure and education, whilst enhancing and protecting wildlife and taking a long-term holistic view towards improving flood defences and reducing flood risk. We've introduced the council to wildfire and wetland trust twice now, but sadly, you haven't taken up the offer. They've been in touch, but no conversations taking place. I just want to read the most recent correspondence uh, received from the Wildfire and Wetland Trust consulting, senior consultant director, Gareth Bradbury. He says this, Your proposal certainly lays out a plan true to the ethos of sustainable development. It ensures through a diverse offer that the landscape is changed only positively. Biodiversity is protected and, where possible, enhanced. And economic benefits come from a network of strong, ethically sound ventures fully integrated with the local community. We continue to look forward to helping in all or any stages of such a project, from data collection, feasibility studies, particularly for a visit to central wetland habitat enhancements, stakeholder engagement events, concept and detailed designs, including sustainable drainage schemes, wetland treat treatment systems, working with an architect for building design if necessary, drawing up specifications for contractors, site supervision during construction, and writing management. That's visitor, centre, and habitat plans. I heard nothing back from the council after you again put me in touch with them. So it might be pending the outcome of the meeting on the 9th of December that we arrange a teleconference with key staff to see what they may require from us. Shame. It is definitely worth including the Environment Agency and Natural England as stakeholders so all these things can be considered in one plan. So I hope this presentation and this document will give you food for thought. And I also hope that the Stop the Hoylet Golf Resort Group, along with others, as well as those who support the current golf resort plans, will get behind this proposal and encourage the Council to rethink and dramatically reshape their plans in the light, in the light of this. We also hope that Margaret Greenwood and our ward councillors will get behind these proposals. And before I wrap this up, please consider one thing. If this eco-golf resort idea does go ahead, if we manage to make this happen, even if it eventually fails, the Wildfowl and Wetland Centre, in which it will sit, which won't fail, will lend much greater protection against further development. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing to lose by supporting this. It can and should be better. Well, I'm sure you'll agree that was a very informative presentation. If you have questions, can you just save them up because uh, we've plenty of opportunity at the end. I'm now going to hand over to, uh, to Kevin O'Rourke from the Stop Hoylet Golf Resort Action Group, who's going to give about 15 minutes, 20 minutes uh, of, of the views of the Action Group. <laughs> by, all, by all means, try. <laughs> if we can, uh, great, if possibly, it can be arranged.
Uh -huh. Pass this up, Paul. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to open the window? <laughs> <laughs> Oh. There's interference. We're just having a slight technical difficulty. You just bear with us for a moment. change in the program whilst uh, whilst Karen's sorting out the, the technical difficulties. Oh, hang on, <coughs> looks like we might have some life now. Okay. There we go. Okay. <coughs> okay. Right, I've got I've got a hand over to, to Karen now. And yeah we'll get we'll get the rest of the lights off if we can arrange if we can arrange that so you'll be able to see the screen more clearly. Okay, thank you Karen. Hello, my name's Karen O'Rourke and I'm speaking for the Stockholm Lake Office of Tax Relief. Yeah. Uh, you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the council have published very limited information about this resort, done little public consultation and are completely ignoring the very real concerns of local residents. They have published this pretty green map with lots of trees and lakes and it all looks very lovely and innocent but it lacks any real detail. We're campaigning to stop the resort because we feel they are failing to publicise the real impacts of this resort, negative impacts which far outweigh any perceived benefits. So what have the council told us so far? Well it's 295 acres of greenbelt land, that's the size of 150 football pitches. A hotel, conference facilities and spa managed by Celtic Manor, two golf courses and clubhouses, a Lynx Academy and maintenance buildings, a large car park, a bypass all link road, and an, an estate of 160 luxury houses, all band H. Um, there was also previous mention of 40 apartments, but maybe David could confirm that. Um, and these are going to be built by Story Homes. It's clear that this is a massive development that's going to dominate the landscape for miles around and have a devastating effect on the character of the area. We think this is a more representative plan of the scale of the resort. You can see the new link road in red, and this will connect from the level crossing to Sogol Massey Road. And we've superimposed the estate that the same developers built in Clanethley, and it's shown to scale with the same number of houses. So this gives a much better indication of the area of the land that will be concreted over. So why do we think the resort is a bad idea? Well there's just so many negative impacts but the main reasons include a developer with a dubious track record, increased flood risk, environmental damage, the resort's not financially viable without the luxury houses, golf is in decline and only 0.2% of tourists come to the Wirral for golf. It's a poor investment for jobs, alternatives haven't been considered, weak public consultation, the costs are spiralling. The council has spent so far at least £1 million and we think it's significantly higher. There doesn't seem to be any financial business plan in place and it's going to set a very dangerous precedent for building on the Greenbelt. 
trying to find a developer since 2002 and no one was interested until the houses were added. All of the other developers dropped out or were deemed not suitable and the council are very fond of saying that the developer is Jack Nicklaus but it's actually the Nicklaus Joint Venture Group. The Venture Group has five directors and they're registered in a house in South Wales. Jack Nicklaus is not a director and he personally owns no shares in the company. Nicklaus is merely lending his name to give them kudos with the local planners and he'll be paid a massive fee to design a golf course. There appears to be a spider web of companies behind the venture group with companies owning companies owning companies. The same director's names come up over and over again with each of these companies and if we've even found out that one of these companies is registered in Jersey, presumably for tax avoidance purposes. Sure. The main shareholder of the venture group is a guy called James Anderson and he's an investor and a developer. We think it's all about the houses. If you go to the Nicklaus Design website it says Nicklaus Design has been credited with elevating the relationship between golf and luxury home communities. Communities that feature a Nicklaus Design golf course have resulted in the highest real estate value, oh. the highest average home price, the greatest velocity of sales. Anderson's worked with Nicklaus before. He's worked, uh, his venture group promised to bring a Hilton Hotel to the Nicklaus Golf Resort in McKinnis in Clanethley. The council were very supportive of the project. They enthused about how the project would be fantastic, bringing jobs and tourism, and put Clanethley on the map. They received over a million pounds of grants. Now the Hoy Lake site is on a floodplain, and the council says, this detailed technical issue is one that the Nicklaus group have experience in dealing with. However, the Hilton group pulled out of the McKinnis project because of flooding concerns. Yeah. 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 They built a golf club, but the Hilton Hotel has never been built, and all the associated jobs and tourism never materialised. <coughs> However, the Venture Group did build 175 houses in McInnes, and this is the estate. <coughs> Anderson was the director of Carnes Construction, which built the houses at the McInnes site. And after the houses were built, his company went into voluntary liquidation, leaving 81 creditors. Many of them were local suppliers, such as plumbers and electricians, who were initially owed over £1 million. Interestingly, McKinney's Homes, of which Anderson is also a director, which sold the houses, wasn't affected by the bankruptcy. <laughs> now, Royal Council say they've undertaken due diligence when looking into the background of the Nicholas Joint Venture Group. <laughs> Um, Mr. Davis has said there's a Nicklaus course down in Wales that we've looked at where they've got a good track record. <laughs> Given their track record, there's a very high risk that, like in Wales, it just could be the houses that are built and the hotel may never happen. Is this really the right developer for Hoyle Lake? No. 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 So this is the Environment Agency flood risk, for, flood risk map for the River Burkitt. And you can see that much of the resort lies in the highest risk flood zone 3, including where they propose to build the houses, <coughs> which means it's likely to flood at a 1 in 100 year storm event. Now this doesn't mean that flooding can only happen once in a century, but it's every year there's a 1 in 100 or a 1% chance of flooding. But these flood levels are based on historic data. And with climate change, we're experiencing these extreme events more frequently. Now, planning policy should steer away um, development away from the flood risk zones. And the Environment Agency um, will be asked to look at the developers' flood risk assessments. But the Council can ignore their advice. And the Environment Agency can only object if the flood risk is not made worse up to that 1 in 100 year level. Remember, it's not the Environment Agency or the planning, office who will planning officers who will ultimately decide if the flood risk is acceptable. It's the planning committee made up of councillors who will give the planning permission.
Um, so this is a photo of the golf resort site, and you can see that it's doing what a floodplain is supposed to do. It's flooding. The, the site acts like a sponge. It stores water in times of heavy rain, so the flood flows or runoff is held back, reducing the peak, peak flood flows in the Burkitt, and so it reduces the flood risk to Mells and Morton. So what happens when you build on a floodplain? Well, you reduce its capacity to store the water and you increase the speed of the runoff of the water because natural areas which soak up water are being concreted over. Large areas of the resort are going to be concreted over. The hotel, the car parks, the clubhouses, the maintenance buildings and 160 houses, patios, driveways, all the roads. So how can the developer ensure that they get planning permission with regards to flood risks? Well, they'll build what are called sustainable drainage systems or storage lakes, and these will be incorporated into the golf course lakes. And they'll build the flood floor, le the floor levels of the hotel and the houses at the road <coughs> above that one in 100 year level, plus a contingency for climate change. They could use fill from another part of the site, but that land is an ex-tip site and the landfill may be contaminated or not suitable for building on. So they may have to import thousands of tonnes of fill. Now a golf course half the size of the Hoylake Resort was, requ was estimated to require half a million tonnes of fill. That's about 25,000 truckloads. But if the, developer proposes, if the developer proposes these sorts of measures, they can satisfy planning requirements for flood risks. Now remember, they only have to design flood defences up to that 1 in 100 year level. This is an estate in Ruffin built in 2009, where residents bought their homes safe in the knowledge that their flood levels were actually at the 1 in 1,000 year level. But in 2012, 122 houses <coughs> flooded. <coughs> and this is Carlisle, where their £38 million worth of flood defences were breached, despite being built as a 1 in 200 year level, because Storm Desmond was actually a 1 in 1300 year storm. This is Oakland's Drive near Carlisle, just a few weeks ago, where eight properties flooded because of water running off farmland. Farmland where Story Homes, the same housing developer for Hoylake, are called, currently building an estate. Now despite the local council being aware of flooding problems, they gave planning permission. And Story Homes says all of our homes are dear to the Environment Agency planning requirements. Now Story Homes aren't yet only up to be in the cause of the flooding downstream, but on their website they say, we continue to support those who have been affected and we're looking at how we can increase levels of water storage. Story Homes will be working with the council to ensure that appropriate precautions are in place for the future to prevent flooding on Oakland's Drive. It's absolutely clear that urbanisation increases flood risk. It alters the natural flood processes and it can increase flood risk to properties further downstream. With climate change, it means that the frequency and intensity of storms are increasing and historical data is no, un lo no longer accurate when predicting floods. This is some of the recent world storm events. Of particular note is the repeated extreme events of 2012. If you have one event followed by another, followed by another, the ground is already soaked, the rivers are already full and quite possibly those golf resort lakes will already be full. So where does the water running off those large concrete areas go to? We're only just beginning to see the effects of climate change and we simply don't yet know what the effects will be over the coming decades. It's a highly risky and some would say reckless strategy to build on a floodplain. Now, while we're on the subject of Story Homes, um, we've looked at some of their reviews on the websites, um, and you can see that they've had a lot of criticism for being poor quality, having absolutely no customer service. Is this really who we want to be building the houses on our quality golf resorts? No. Uh, no. <coughs> the 
site is home to a wide variety of species, some of them legally protected. Waders from the internationally important deestry use the area as a refuge and they roost and feed here. Birds include curlew, lapwing, red shank, oyster catchers. Many of the birds are on the Birds of Conservation Concern Red List. The small fields, hedgerows and ditches are highly biodiverse compared to intensively farmed land elsewhere. It's an ideal habitat for nesting. Other wildlife includes waterfowl, brown hare, toads, hedgehogs, lizards, bats and barn owls. There are over 100 plant species, some of them uncommon. Farmland managed at low intensity is nearly always good for wildlife and very little of it exists on the Wirral and Cheshire region. Of particular note is Gilroy Scrape, which adjoins the resort, where, which until recently was home to 5% of the UK's black-tailed godwit population, until the landowner drained the site. The landowner has submitted plans to develop Gilroy Scrape and the surrounding fields for housing. In 2009, the council received a report which stated that part of the site met the criteria for designation as a site of biological importance, or what is now termed a local wildlife site. However, the council sat on this report and chose to do nothing about it. And if they had, they might have presented the draining of Gilroy Scrape. More recently, the Local Wildlife Site Partnership have classed these areas shown in green as an alert site or potential local wildlife site, which is a large proportion of the golf resort area. So can golf resorts be environmentally friendly? We believe that this proposed course would be totally alien for the existing flora and fauna that live on the site. Golf requires the creation of unnatural habitats which are intensely managed with high volumes of water and chemicals. Stormwater runoff from the resort would be highly loaded with nutrients and there is concern about aquatic life and the Mells Meadows site at special scientific interest downstream, which could be damaged by this nutrient-rich water. The council say the resort will provide <coughs> opportunities for wildlife enhancement, but the truth is, despite the golf industry trying to portray themselves as environmentally friendly, Golf resorts can devastate the habitats which they replace. Now we're told the course is to have a Lynx Academy and we think this is likely to be just another name for a driving range. Celtic Managed Resorts has a 28 bay, 28 bay two tier driving range. There have been complaints about high intensity lights from the developers club in McInnes shining into houses a couple of kilometres away, most nights until late at night. There's also the impact of lighting from the hotel, the car park and the bypass and the housing estate. There'll be traffic pollution caused by potentially thousands of HDV, HDV wagons at the construction stage and ongoing pollution from the link road, including traffic standing at the level crossing every time a train passes. The World Health Organization already say that pollution levels in Birkenhead are do too dangerous to breathe. And don't forget the carbon footprint of this resource. The council have done no clarification uh, calculations to assess the massive carbon, Im carbon impacts that this resort will create. The bypass will be a direct link to the motorway via Sogol Massey Road, increasing traffic on a road already used by 100,000 vehicles a week. There'll be traffic chaos at the level crossing every time a train passes. And a study into the effect of new roads by the Campaign for Rural England has shown that these types of roads substantially increase pollution and put massive pressure on the surrounding road networks. And economic benefits were shown to be slower than expected, didn't materialise at all, and most worryingly, were just as likely to suck money out of the area as to bring money in. Passing trade in Mills and Mawson will also be affected. Now, in order to overturn Greenbelt planning policy, the developers will, developers will have to prove very special circumstances and they will use jobs and tourism as a justification. Now, Councillor Davis has said that this resort will be a globally significant tourist attraction. <laughs> it will bring hundreds of millions of tourism revenue and, and will create hundreds of jobs oh, and attract thousands of visitors. Now just think about that statement, a globally significant tourist attraction. When I think of a globally significant tourist attraction, I think of the Taj Mahal, Taj Mahal or Disneyland. 
Yep. Now, the Hope and Open at Hoylake brought 200,000 visitors and they say 76 million in economic benefit. But only 19 million of that was direct economic benefit to the whole of the Wirral. Now, the Open has happened twice and it can come again and its economic benefits don't rely on there being a Hoylake golf resort. So where is Mr Davis getting his figure of this resort bringing in hundreds of millions of tourism revenue? Arguably, he's double counting the open benefits and putting them onto the golf resort. So are the benefits being exaggerated? The golf resort is to provide 175 jobs. This doesn't take into account the existing jobs at the municipal course, the loss of jobs on the farms, the impact on passing trade in Mells and Morton, the loss of jobs at other Wirral hotels and um, possibly ho uh, golf courses. And what about the impact on Hoylake businesses? A, report so a resort such as this is designed to keep people spending in the resort. The council has so far agreed to spend at least one million on this project. That equates to at least 5,700 pounds per job. Is this really a good investment in jobs? Over the last few years, the Council have made grants to various organisations which have created significantly more jobs at much lower cost, such as the money given to the Wirral Chamber of Commerce, which works out at £69 per job to create nearly 3,000 jobs. So we think you could get significantly better return on jobs by investing in other projects. Now the Council Sale Resort is projected to bring about 5,500 golf visitors a year. That's just an average of 15 golf visitors a day. <laughs> visitors came for the open and they don't need a golf resort in order to come. And the Council's own recent tourism studies show that 91% of visitors come to the Wirral for the coast and countryside. Just 0.2% come for golf. And yet we already have 14 golf courses on the Wirral. Golf is declining. The council have tried and failed to sell off other courses. So why are we investing in a golf resort? Even Celtic <coughs> Manor's resort only makes 10% of its income from golf. There are plenty of brownfield sites not on the floodplain for building hotels and houses. Yeah. Yeah. Even the council's own consultants have said this resort is not financially viable without the houses and it's not even a unique proposition. At Halton Park in Bolton, Peel Holdings are trying to develop a golf resort but they say they need to build a thousand Greenbelt houses to pay for it. They say it will bring jobs, jobs and tourism, it will be a Ryder Cup standard course, it will be the only development of its kind in the North West. It will put Bolton on the global stage. Great. Sounds familiar doesn't it? <laughs> So are, there, are these golf resorts just a smokescreen to get around planning policy to build houses on the There's space for building over 16,000 houses on brownfield sites on the Wirral, yet the council are undertaking a review of Greenbelt land. There are currently, they are currently consulting on the review, but from what we've seen of it, it's going to allow the council to change planning, policy, planning policy to justify building houses on the green belt. The golf resort will set a very dangerous precedent. Already the council have received submissions from landowners and developers for building on the green belt. And this is a map of all the sites where the developers want to build on the green belt. No. Absolutely appalling. It's obvious to us that the golf resort and the bypass road right across the green belt is going to make it much easier for all these housing developers to happen in the area. So what are the alternatives? 